Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of John, and we're going to pick up with the beginning of chapter three tonight. I'm especially excited about this. Not only is the Gospel of John my favorite book in the Bible, but chapter three has got to be one of the greatest and most important chapters in the entire Bible. So I'm, I'm really excited to do this tonight. Uh, with me tonight, we have Brother Stephen, and I just met him. And uh, I'd like you to take just a moment and tell people about your YouTube channel. And I'm going to ask everybody to subscribe to Brother Stephen's channel. Go ahead, Brother. Hey, everybody. My name's Stephen. I'm 21 from Gainesville. Um, I made this channel back in 2013, but its purpose I made it for back then is irrelevant because since then I've come to faith in Jesus. And a little bit of just my brief testimony, I used to be a quote-unquote lordship salvationist where I've always known about Jesus. I've always done my best to follow him. And like I had always tried my best to like do good and be obedient to him and you know to be pleasing to Jesus. But I kind of fell for the... Final Call 07 trap, where I started to kind of believe unless I was perfect, like I wouldn't make it at all. Um, but then, like through the future, through the help of some other brothers here on the Gospel of Grace, and mostly, though, through reading, you know, God's Word, you know, His Holy Inspired Word here in the Bible, I came to know that works aren't going to save me, and the only way to be saved is through faith alone in Christ, al you know, in Christ alone. Because Jesus paid it all when he died on the cross and when he shed his blood for us and when he was buried and rose again for our sins. Um, I don't really have any videos on my channel as of right now except one really old, like irrelevant one. But I am definitely considering doing some videos in the future. But, yeah, this is my first time doing this, and, you know, it's awesome to be able to share my testimony. Brother Luke. All right. Thank you, brother. Uh, please, everybody, subscribe to his YouTube channel. I, and uh, you, you've you already impressed me as being very articulate. You certainly can communicate well. So um, I'm, I'm anxious to see what kind of videos that you come up with in the future. All right. Let's begin with chapter 3, verse 1. Now, those of you who know me, you know that I am what um, I call a KJV firstist. Uh, I always want to look at the KJV first, but I am not against looking at other translations or commentaries uh, or uh, listening to Brother Stephen or anybody else. Any anybody that can help me to understand the scriptures, uh, I want to consider that too. But so we will consider the KJV, the scriptures, and the other that I look at will be the amplified version. And let's consider that to be like a commentary. So beginning chapter 3, verse 1 in the KJV, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The saying came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. I don't want to go too far at one time uh, on this chapter <clears throat> because I'm, each each uh, portion of it is going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot in it. <clears throat> but the thing that I noticed here in the KJV and uh, in the Amplified, it, it says, verse 1, Now there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Uh, no change there, but it says, A ruler, member of the Sanhedrin among the Jews. So I, when it says a ruler of the Jews... A ruler of the Sanhedrin, which was the kind of like the um, the government of the Jewish people, uh, the, the the Pharisees uh, and the um, Sanhedrin, uh, they were the most religious. They were the leaders, and so people uh, respected these people. They they considered them to be the authorities, kind of like today when we look at the clergy. And we consider that these people, a lot of people don't study for themselves. They rely on the clergy to teach them. And this Sanhedrin uh, was that class of, of, of uh, Jewish, Jewish people. Brother, what's your reaction to that? 
Um, I mean, I'm looking here. I don't see the word, you know, Sanhedrin here in, you know, my King James Version. But, I mean, the Pharisees were like a huge group. Like, they were like the very religious, and they were really like looked up to. But like, well, back in that time, at least as we know from Jesus, they were also very, you know, self-righteous at the time. And were really kind of about like their own traditions and own their like self-righteousness. And... This is like one of those cases where, you know, he comes to Jesus and then Jesus teaches, you know, that he must be born again. Otherwise, he can't see the kingdom of God. And, you know, he marvels at this. Uh, yeah, that that uh, that event is coming up. And the the idea of him being in the Sanhedrin, that was a statement that, that was in the Amplified Version. And the Amplified, as I said, I'm using it kind of like a commentary. Uh, <clears throat> the, the committee or individuals that did the Amplified translation, uh, if I look at their, their uh, version, and it, it's almost like having them sitting in along here with us uh, because they're amplifying on the Scripture. And what they amplified, what they added, which what they added, of course, is not Scripture. We don't add to the Scriptures. But... You and I, brother, we're adding our thoughts on it right now as we discuss it. So that's how I'm looking at the Amplified is these particular uh, people, uh, their thoughts as they look at the scriptures and they say that this re leader of the Jews, they say that he was part of the Sanhedrin. Now, we do know that as a fact as we study through the whole scriptures. The Sanhedrin was the the um, the leadership of the, the kind of the religious party of the Jews. Uh but the interesting thing is, it says that he came at night. And the fact that he came at night is very revealing. It says, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, uh, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Uh, so when we, the, what does it tell us, brother? Do you have any, anything that uh, uh, when it says he came by night, does that lead you to believe anything all right well before i say that like i will say i guess i don't have the amplified version i guess i have like the normal version of the king james but when it says by night you know that's usually when i think of that it's like typically when no one else is around so it's almost like he's going in secret like to not be seen by like the other pharisees i would guess typically uh yeah i would say at this point that's uh, just my guess though yeah, I, I think that this is telling us that perhaps Nicodemus was uh, being very careful um, because he knew that um, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, the, the Jewish religious leaders as a whole, uh, all immediately were skeptical of Jesus. And, and so he did not want to do this publicly where everybody could see him, where he's associating with Jesus. He didn't want to be stigmatized, but he was curious and he seems to be impressed. He says, you must be a man from God because of these miracles you do. And uh, but I think he's coming at night because uh, maybe not because of embarrassment, but because of because of caution. Uh, the interesting thing about the miracles, though, is that. It says, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now, I don't see miracles today very often. I do have a video I made a few years back titled Signs and Wonders. And it's an example of several things I've witnessed in my life that I consider to be miraculous signs. And I didn't believe because I first received a miraculous sign. But after I believed over the years, I have seen signs that have even strengthened my faith uh, because I, I'm, I'm convinced that this is definitely a sign from God. So these signs do serve a purpose and the miracles. And, you know, I think that Jesus, he wanted to heal people and he wanted to feed people. But the primary reason for the miracles was a sign for the people. And, and we don't see the signs today. I'm quite skeptical of people today 
who um, believe that they uh, they have the, the the gift of healing and uh, uh, not that God doesn't heal today, but I don't think he has specific individuals where he is a gift of healing. God answers all of our prayers for healing. If if it's his part of his will, he'll say yes and heal us. Um, but the signs that we see in the scriptures here, these kinds of miraculous signs, we don't see them today. We don't see someone who has um, an, an, an arm, let's say is missing an arm, and all of a sudden they have an arm again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these miracles were so dramatic that they were convincing proofs that he was from God. But do you, can you think of a problem where he did these signs and uh, they didn't react the way that, that uh, Nicodemus did, saying this, this is an indication that you truly are a man from God because of these miracles. Uh, some people reacted a different way to his miracles, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, well, there was a punch that was that like blasphemy in the Holy Spirit would say that would say he had a demon or that he was, you know, casting out demons by Beelzebub. Uh, exactly. That's that's what I was uh, leading towards is that uh, Nicodemus, he concludes that he says, no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And yet we know, uh, I don't know if this is coming up in the Gospel of John. Or, or if it is in some of the other gospel accounts, because every gospel account, uh, uh, if, if you were to list every event in the gospel accounts, and let's say there's 50 kind of events, like this event where Nicodemus comes to see Jesus, uh, not every event is in each of the four gospels. So some of the events are only in one or two gospel accounts. Some of them are in... Mm -hmm maybe three or four. And it's not, that doesn't tell us that the, the accounts are not true. It just tells us that the gospel, according to Matthew, he's to giving his account and someone else is giving their account. And if you and I give an account of our time together, it's not going to be, we're not going to necessarily uh, emphasize each event the same. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, shouldn't bring into question the truth of the scriptures, but the idea that, um, uh, uh, the the concept of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I'm not positive if it's coming up in the Gospel of John or or not, because I haven't looked that far ahead yet. But uh, that's, I think I remember it mostly from Matthew or something like that. Um, I'll have to find it, but like I don't remember exactly where I saw it the most. Yeah, well, that's something I don't need to get too sidetracked with that, but I was just making the point that, okay. W yeah. I, I said that Nicodemus considers Jesus' miracles as, pro as proof of who, of who he is, that he's a man from God. And yet we know that some other people, they see the miracles, and they don't react that same way at all. They consider it uh, uh, that, hey, he's doing these miracles through the power of Beelzebub, not of God. So uh, it is a good thing that at least Nicodemus considers Jesus' miracles as proof that he's from God, not from the devil. Um, now, let me move on. Um, and by the way, uh, maybe I confused you when I was explaining the King James Version and the Amplified Version. Um, the King James Version is what I'm reading. I have a parallel yeah. Bible here. Right next to it, I have the Amplified Bible translation. There, It's not the Amplified Version of the King James. It's just the Amplified Version. So, yeah, I guess I did get a little confused. Like, Of course, I only have a King James in front of me right now. Yeah. All right, that's fine. But the only purpose of using the Amplified is sometimes it'll give me a little bit of insight that I didn't get uh, on my own. Uh, okay, so now let's go to... Um, Verse 3. Okay. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, well, um, this, the, the idea of being born again uh, is, is, uh, the, it, and it's, it's essential because that's, that's how we get saved. Being born yeah. again is synonymous with saying you got saved. Um, so here's the first introduction of the term. I don't believe anywhere else in the scriptures, uh, in the Old Testament uh, scriptures, I don't believe the term born again shows up. Matter of fact, I don't even know if the term born again appears anywhere but the Gospel of John. 
I'd have to look that up and see. But I, I suspect that born again is a term that's unique to John's gospel. I know that it is not in any of Paul's writings. He didn't use that same term. Uh, but but it's this is the term that Jesus used when he's talking to, to uh, Nicodemus. And it's the first time we see the term. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What is your response to that? Um, like to that, just that one verse there. Uh, oh, wait. Am I muted? Oh, wait, no, I'm talking. Oh, wait, no, I'm not. All right. Uh, my response to like that verse is, um, I mean, I agree with it, you know, 100%. You know, the only way to be saved is to, you know, have faith alone, you know, in Christ alone and to come to him. Because the only way you can be born again is to come to Jesus, not through like yourself or like anything else. And although Nicodemus react kind of has a slightly different reaction, as we'll see in the next verse when we get there. But I mean, I totally like. That's pretty much it. The only way you can be saved is to, you know, come to Jesus. But. I guess that's just what weren't what they were accustomed to kind of back then, because they were used to like the laws and traditions that they had. Yeah, as we go forward, you're gonna we know that uh, Nicodemus gets quite confounded uh, with this idea, with this concept of being born again. And um, he's kind of shocked by it and doesn't understand it at first. Uh, so let's without uh, uh, the, the f next few verses are going to we're going to get into it more deeply. But the, the thing that the, besides the term born again, the thing that sticks out to me is the word accept. Yes, uh, that is that is saying that um, this is the only way you cannot see the kingdom of God kingdom of God unless. Except means unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. And this is where the it, except is kind of like ex, uh, exclusive. Um, uh, this is the exclusivity of Jesus. Uh, I have a video titled uh, The Sufficiency and Exclusivity of Jesus. And uh, uh, Jesus says throughout this chapter, we're going to get this point that there is only one way. Uh, we, we, of course, we know, uh, uh, I think it's John 14, 6 or 14, 10. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, no man cometh to the Father but by me. This is another except verse where it says, except a man, uh, no man come to the Father except through me. And he says in this verse, uh, you cannot see the kingdom of God uh, except You've been born again. So this shows us that there is, and it, we're beginning to see the exclusivity, uh, that Jesus is making a claim that he is the only way. And uh, this that's the first time I think we're seeing it in this, in, uh, in that verse there. Uh, let me go on to verse 4. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplified in verse 3. Jesus answered him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless a person is born again, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, he cannot ever see and experience the kingdom of God. Yeah. So you see how it amplifies it. It's kind of like the way that we're doing right now as we're discussing the verse. We're amplifying in our own words what how we interpret it. And this really expounds the, on being born again as reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified. And then it says he cannot ever see and experience the kingdom of God. So this ever is emphasizing what I was saying is uh, that uh, exclusivity, is the exclusivity of Jesus, of this. There's no other way to do it except you're born again. Yeah, this is it or, or else there's no chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and some people would argue that, well, that's yeah. really really very very narrow minded. Uh, that you think that there's only one way to get into heaven, but over and over again, not only in this chapter, but many many other examples we can give people of of this claim from Jesus and all throughout the scriptures that there is no other way. You you're not going to get into heaven through Buddha 
uh, Muhammad's not the way, uh, the Pope's not the way, the Virgin Mary's not the way. There is one way. And some people would say object to that. And they want to think that there's, matter of fact, I've been very disappointed with some people that I respected who argued that, um, well, the, the Quran is a great religious book and, and, and Islam is another one of the world's great religions and there's many different paths to God. And I heard that from the last Bush president, George Bush II, heard him say that. I've even heard Billy Graham say that. There we I've, go. Heard, I've heard quite a few people say that, that I thought understood the exclusivity of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone, and yet they act like uh, it. No, it's that that's narrow-minded to believe that. That you know, what about the people from uh, who have all these other religions? What about all those people? Well, I'm sorry, I happen to believe the scriptures, and the scripture says Jesus is the only way. Yeah, sorry, it froze on me for a second. All right, did you uh, did you hear what I said? You want to respond to it? Uh, I heard like the end of what you said, but like my call froze and I got kicked out of the call and had to rejoin. Okay. Well, I was talking about some of the people I've found that uh, like uh, George Bush, the president and Billy Graham and other people I've heard say that, uh, uh, that uh, Islam is, um, is a, a just another great religion. And, and the Quran is another holy book and, and that there's many different ways to get to God. And I say that it, I've been shocked. I, I thought these people understood biblical Christianity, particularly, uh, you know, George Bush claimed to be a born again Christian. Uh, Billy Graham, of course, is one of the most famous evangelists of, of modern times. And yet they say that people uh, can get to heaven other ways. And it's, it's, it's shocking and disappointing when I find that. But, but we find from this verse and, and many others we're going to be coming to that, uh, no, Jesus claimed exclusivity. And, and then people react that, well, you're being very narrow-minded. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are uh, some verses that use that word narrow, too, that come to my mind. But let me ask you to respond now that you're, uh, you're online again. All right. Well, I just flipped over to, to when we just mentioned this, John 14, 6, when it comes to like this subject. I mean, Jesus himself just said it. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And nobody can come to the Father except, you know, by me. So, I mean, it's just clear that that's the only way that there is. There is no, you know, being a good person. There is no other religion or self-righteousness or anything that can save you or ever reconcile you with Jesus or ever improve your relationship with God. I mean, Jesus did it all when he came down here and he said for us to come to him and that that's it. And I mean, people may call you narrow minded, but I mean, this is what Jesus said and his words are absolute and they endure until today and forever. His words never pass away. Yeah, uh, I, I, the, this verse stands out to me because it seems to me, at least in the Gospel of John, it seems to be the first time we learn about this exclusivity. Uh, and in and, and John 14, 6, uh, that's uh, Jesus saying so plainly that nobody should misunderstand. He is making the claim that he's the only way that, to get into heaven. So a person, if they read that, then they're, they're confronted with, I think, three choices. C.S. Lewis uh, described it this way. He said, you must either believe that Jesus is the only way, as he claimed, mm -hmm. uh, or you can believe that he's a liar, or you can call him a lunatic to claim that you can't get into heaven unless you get to go come to me. You know, <laughs> So that's how C.S. Lewis um, uh, defined it, uh, Lord, liar, or lunatic is what he said. Um, but there's going to be many more verses we're coming to, but that is interesting that uh, John 3, what is it, verse? Uh, John 3, 3. John 3, 3. So we only get three verses in, and we get this claim of exclusivity. Okay, let's go to verse 4. It says, Nicodemus saith unto him, 
How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right here, he's already like, he's thinking so like earthly right here. I mean, he's, it's, it's like he's just taking it so literally. Yeah, and, and we, we got to remember that this Nicodemus is one of the rulers of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, the most learned, the most respected group. And yet he and Jesus will go on to tell him that how can you not understand this simple thing? Uh, and yet not only Nicodemus, but so many of them, uh, they are confounded with these ideas that Jesus is introducing uh, because uh, some of these things, really, we don't find them explained in the same way throughout the Old Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that people had to have faith in God to have salvation, uh, and then they, rather than their own merit, like for the best, the first example, of course, is in the Garden of Eden. You've mm -hmm. got uh, Adam and Eve are given a choice. You can continue uh, uh, relying on the, tr the tree of life. And the tree of life, to me, is a picture of Jesus because Jesus is, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So Jesus is this, tr this represents Jesus, the tree of life, and he was nailed to a tree. So in that, that's a picture of his crucifixion. So Adam and Eve, they could rely on this, uh, just this tree of life and relying on God to provide everything for them and not try to learn everything on their own and go and get all this knowledge of good and evil. Or they could decide, like Satan told them, no, go that way. Don't believe God. Do it. Uh, go, go your own way. Learn, learn about right and wrong. Eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then you'll be like God. You'll understand good and evil. And that's, that was the first example of this problem that man throughout history has been trying to uh, succeed through his own efforts, through his own knowledge, and rather than just relying on God to be a savior. And so you've got that and, and dozens of other examples. Uh, I have a playlist titled uh, The Bloody Trail. And we I go from Genesis through Revelation, example, showing examples of these uh, the blood atonement. Now, as we go through the scriptures, uh, the people uh, in the distant past, they didn't understand the clear meanings the way we do, because we look back and we have the advantage of hindsight. So we can look back at these things like when Adam and Eve, uh, they fell. The, the, the first thing that dawned on them that, that was that they were naked and they, 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 they had to remedy it. They knew they didn't want to be naked. What are we going to do? Well, they decided they solved the problem themselves. They'd sew fig leaves together and cover themselves. They would provide a covering. They would do the work themselves and solve the problem themselves. But God wasn't satisfied with their covering. He, he, he gave them a covering that he provided the animal skin and the animal skin represented death An animal had to die so they could be covered and it required blood. So there must be a bloody death to provide them proper covering. And so that is another example of man trying to remedy the problem himself throughout history through his own efforts, through his own works. And yet God all the time says, Just trust me, I'll provide the covering. I'll provide, I'll provide the solution to the sin problem. Uh, I don't know, remember why I got off on that, but oh yeah, the point I'm making is that um, we have the advantage of hindsight because understanding his death, burial, and resurrection and the meaning of it and, and the significance of who he is and what he's done, we look back at all these events throughout the, the Bible and with hindsight, we understand them in a way that they didn't even understand them that well as they were happening. All right, brother, let me, before I go on, what's your response to all that? Are you talking about like the parody, like of the tree of life? Um, well, I, I compared the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, uh, comparing it to grace and works. Yeah. Like I kind of like that analogy because 
you know, Jesus was killed on a tree, you know, and he is the only way to life. And that's what it was, you know, back then. And, you know, judging by, you know, like the leaves that they put on themselves, trying to cover themselves, that is like a very, very good example of, you know, trying to like do things yourself, trying to cover yourself up yourself. And then, because I remember then God caught them and they got chastised hard. And then, you know, he had to kill to clothe them, you know, and that's when he, you know, forgave them. So, I mean, I think it's like, you know, that's one thing, you know, you know, I know about that story and I think about that, but I honestly don't, I don't really think about that enough. Like, that's a really, you know, awesome analogy. I feel like I could definitely use in the future whenever I'm trying to evangelize or ever preach the gospel to someone. So, I mean, this is, I think it's like super important and yeah. Yeah, uh, I was trying to relate it to the idea that Nicodemus and the other Pharisees and Sanhedrin, but now we're talking about Nicodemus, Nicodemus does not get it. He says, how can a man be born again from his mother's womb? He didn't understand the true meaning of what Jesus said, a man must be born again. Jesus is going to explain it to him, but the fact that, Jesus, that Nicodemus couldn't understand it, this spiritual concept, uh, is an example throughout history how men really didn't understand it that clearly they're looking through like the, a glass that's foggy yeah well i mean this is just being given to him like you know right now for like the first time at least you know in this present moment back then all right let me go on to the next verse here all right let me oh let me look at uh yeah uh, verse 4 in the Amplified, let's see how they phrase it. It says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? Uh, I, I want to relate this for a moment to the idea of, um, of uh, losing one's salvation. Okay. See, when we're born again spiritually, as a child of God and we're saved through our faith in Jesus, um, it's like it's like this baby that comes out to the mother's womb and he can't go back inside. And when we're born again spiritually, we can't undo that. It can't be undone. So to me, this is a picture of, of uh, eternal security, the fact that, you know, he, he says, can, can he go back into your mother's womb? No, you can't, and you can't go. You can't go back before you got saved and, and and undo it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very good picture because no one can go back into their mother's womb. But you know, besides that, you know, nobody can pluck you out of the father's hand either. So, and also, you, I give eternal life, and my sheep will never die. So, I mean, eternal security is. I mean, it's guaranteed to every believer. All right, let me go to the next verse, uh, verse 5, KJV. Jesus answered, verily, verily. Now, with the, verily, verily is a way of, uh, of saying, uh, listen, listen, very carefully. This is very important what I'm telling you. It's an, it's an emphasis. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, this is a problem verse in some ways, and a lot of people, I think, have misused this and misunderstood this verse here. But uh, yes. let, me get, let me get your reaction to verse 5 first before I comment on it. All right. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, you know, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's like I see, you know, here... You know, except a man be born of water. I've actually heard sometimes, like, some people have interpreted that as baptism, actually. Like, because, like, there's some moments I've seen that not only do you have to believe, but you also have to be baptized and believe you have to be baptized, you know, to be saved. So that's one thing that kind of reminds me of. But that's actually talking about birth. And then, of course, being born of the Spirit. And you're born of the Spirit and you receive the Holy Spirit, you know, the moment that you're born again and you trust on Jesus. And 
I mean, it's the same thing that we see in verse 3. Unless you come to Jesus and then be born again, in which right there is where you receive the Holy Spirit, that's the only way you cannot enter into, into the kingdom of God. As it says again, accept. This is the it. This is the only way. Yeah. Now, there is a, there is a group of people uh, that believe that um, water baptism is essential for salvation. Uh, the the term that's uh, theological term that's used for that is called it's called baptismal regeneration. The, these people and many of them come from the Pentecostals uh, or uh, and and the Church of Christ. There's other problems with them too, but the, the, usually within that group and some Baptists, many Baptists believe this also, that. Um, you got to believe on Jesus and then you got to get baptized. And, and until you get wet, you're not saved. And they think that baptismal regeneration means that the water is what, when you get regenerated. And this is a, uh, this is a serious error. There are verses that they can use to support it. And this is one verse that they can point to because they, they point to this of water born of water uh, representing water baptism, as, as you've said, and, I'm going to give you other options for this verse, what it means. But first, let me refute this baptismal regeneration. Um, now, I, I'm i all for uh, people getting water baptized. Yes. Uh, I got water baptized about three months after I got saved. But did you notice I said I was saved three months earlier before I got yeah. water baptized? I did it because... I looked at it as an opportunity, first of all, to make, tell all my family and friends to come to my baptism. And, and that way, uh, it was my, my way. And I think it's a u very useful way for people to publicly acknowledge their faith in Jesus. Jesus says, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I will not acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. And uh, if, if we say we believe in Jesus and we, we're like ashamed or embarrassed to let anybody know, that's not good. Uh, Jesus says, if you're ashamed to be before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. Now, you and I, and a lot of people we know, uh, we talk, we love to talk about Jesus all the time, but a lot of Christians, they keep it very personal, and, and, and uh, they, they don't talk about it much, and I'm not challenging their, their conversion at all. It's just that some people are kind of closet Christians, and uh, they're not as vocal in public as, as we are. Uh, and I don't think necessarily they're any less saved than us, you know, but the, the baptism, not only is it a command, and I, I, we're told to get water baptized, but uh, some people call it an ordinance, okay, at, for the church, we're supposed to get, we're supposed to. It's not we must to get saved. It's not we must uh, in order to stay saved or prove we're saved, uh, it, but we're supposed to, we should. There's a difference between must and should. Uh, so, but it's, it's the, it's the best opportunity a person has when they first put their faith in Jesus to make a public proclamation. Look, uh, come to my baptism. And uh, when I'm baptized, I go underwater. It's, it represents the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. And it represents my death and resurrection with Jesus and my coming uh, out of the water as born again, a child of God. These are what the water baptism represents. So, but now there's another group of people that are, some people call them hyper dispensationalists. Mm -hmm. I've, I've uh, labeled them as Paul only us. <clears throat> they don't believe that you can get saved by reading the gospel of John as we, as we're reading right now, they believe you can only be saved by reading the writings of Paul and you can't get saved any part in the Bible except for Paul's writings. <clears throat> and these people are gone too far with what they call rightly dividing the word of God. But these people, the Paul Onlyus, the hyper dispensationalists, they take the opposite viewpoint on water baptism as the Pentecostals. The, the Pentecostals say you, you're not saved unless you get wet. And the hyper dispensationalist says, um, you better not get wet. You better stay dry because if you get wet, that's, that's proof that your faith is not in Jesus. Your faith is in the baptism as a work. So they're, they're both going from one extreme to the other uh, on this question. 
Uh, I'm going to explain how I see this verse here, but first, just let me get your response to what I just said about these two these two groups. Yeah, um, I mean, besides just the Pentecostals, I've seen many groups that believe that you have to be baptized to be saved, or that it's essential, or that it's like a fruit or like a work of it. But I'd never actually heard about that group that says you have to stay dry. I was like, that's very interesting. Like, I'll definitely uh, have to look into that but like yeah like i believe that let's say just my personal belief is i believe baptism is important that every christian should do it because you know we shouldn't be ashamed but then again i don't believe we have to because it's like if you believe you have to it's like you're trusting in the water and in the act instead of you know on jesus like you're supposed to when jesus is the one who paid it all and he's the one who shed his blood and he said that only by coming to him can you be saved I mean, you can even see examples of, like, the Holy Spirit falling on people or people being saved even without being baptized, like there was the thief on the cross, and then, you know, where the apostles laid hands and the Holy Spirit fell on people. Like, the only way to be saved and receive the Holy Spirit is to believe on Jesus. Although I still believe, you know, that everybody should do baptism and that it's very important, but salvation is only by Jesus. Okay, uh, very good. Um, um, the, the term that you might look into, uh, you could like Google it, or um, uh, it's hyper dispensationalism, or some an, an even more extreme uh, viewpoint of that is ultra dispensationalism. Uh, I made a playlist called Paul Onlyism, debunked, and uh, that that's my own pet word, pet term for the same problem, uh, but. I don't want to get too more sidetracked on that. I've already spent like 10 hours refuting Paul onlyism on my playlist, but let me look at the verse and tell you how I see this verse here. Uh, it says, um, um, verse five, Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now there's two ways that I would say that would be acceptable for a viewpoint on this verse. One is when you're born of water, it could be a reference to the physical birth because mm -hmm. when a woman gives birth, her water breaks. That's the first thing, the water breaks and then the child comes up after the water. So some people think it's a reference, okay, you gotta be born of water. That means you've gotta be born the first time and then you can, and you gotta be born of the spirit. So, but to me, the born of water could also be a reference to Jesus' term of the living water. Um, so either way, uh, I would say I wouldn't have a problem with it. But if a person wants to take this verse to, to support uh, water baptism uh, for baptismal regeneration, that's when I would have to have an argument. Okay, um, let me go on to verse 6. Uh, wait, first, do you have any reaction to any of that before I move on? Uh, to the, oh, to Jesus being the living water? That's something I honestly had never really thought about, but I think it's, that's a really awesome idea. Like, I like that explanation. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, uh, say hi to Brother Neil. I noticed that he joined us. Brother Neil, have you been there very long? Because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, uh, scriptures and stuff. I wasn't looking to see that you joined me. I hope I didn't keep you waiting too long. How are you? I go, Brother Neil. Okay, I guess you know. Uh, speak up if you get if you get a chance. Um, all right then. Let me move on to the next verse here. Um, Verse 6, um, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, this verse 6 could be supporting verse 5, the position that it, it, it is talking about two births here, the flesh and the spirit. And the verse 5 talks about two things, water and the spirit. So it could be just re rephrasing the same idea uh, uh, first you're born physically and then you're born spiritually in verse six. Uh, what do you have any opinion on that brother? I mean, yeah, that's what I was thinking about, like about being born physically and being born, you know, in Jesus. I mean, that's pretty much what I see. Cause that's what is born of the flesh is flesh. And that is what's born of the spirit 
you know, is spirit, you know, passed from death to life, and you know, in Jesus, and then what is born of the flesh is, you know, to that tends to me is like before coming to Jesus, like still like in the world, so to speak, like away, like not born again. Uh, all right. Uh, did you have uh, did you have your uh, your mute on off while you just said that? Um. Wait, I thought I had my mic on when I said that. Um, because I see a note here from uh, Neo, who was with us and just left, and the note here says he is muted and not presented, and has echo. Tell um, him I'm muted. I mean, uh, all I right. Well, I hope your comments were part of it, but if you were, if you left it muted while you were um, talking, then uh, hopefully it turned out. We'll we'll have to see when we rewatch this. Um, yeah. But I think my mic was on, and I just turned it off right before you started talking. Okay. All right, brother. Uh, let me look now at this. So this next verse, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I'll look at that in the Amplified. It says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The physical is merely physical, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay, and then verse 7 in the KJV says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Um, the verse eight, the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. That's, that's a tough one to understand there. Do you have yeah. any, uh, any opinion on that? Yeah. Like I've always, I think I've had a hard time with this one, but I mean, I'm just looking, like, at the end, I guess, so is everyone that, like, is born of the Spirit. I guess it makes, I guess it kind of reminds me of, like, following after, like, Jesus. But like I said, sometimes I get lost on this one, so I think I'm just going to stop my comment here. The, the, the only thing I, I can think of uh, is I don't think that pertains to our walk at all or, or our discipleship. It, it just pertains to the fact that he's, he's further emphasizing the difference between a physical reality and a spiritual reality. Um, um, it's not uh, something spiritual is not something. It's like when he said um, the, the kingdom of God is here now. He, he said that the, it's not... Uh, it's not. Um, uh, it's not with. Uh, I forgot how it's phrased. Uh, he he said, the the, the kingdom of his, as God is not a, like a physical place that where you can say here it is or there it is. He says it's uh, the kingdom of God is spiritual. Uh, I wish I had that verse exactly right right now, but uh, I don't want to take the time to search for it. Um, all right, let me go on to the. The next verse, um, and Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? So this is an example of what we were talking about earlier. The fact that Jesus is saying some things that we understand because we have the advantage of hindsight now uh and but it's in in that particular time they didn't get it there's a lot of things they didn't get they understood things partially but not completely um and so jesus is uh, showing that wait you're you're one of the teachers and you don't get this that's that's unfortunate um let's go on to uh uh, verse 11, verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Um, I think this is a good point to uh, end the broadcast. Uh, what I'm going to do it's my custom, brother, to uh, every Bible study that I do, I want to reserve a little time in the end here 
to an in, to offer an invitation to the audience, an invitation to receive the free gift of salvation. So that's what I want to do now. But first, any let me get your general reaction uh, and summarize what we've we discussed so far tonight. Well, I mean, so far we've just. Well, we started off with like Nicodemus, you know, coming to Jesus at night, you know, being cautious as being one of like the being one of the, let's say, man of the Pharisees. And then he was explained that, you know, the only way to be saved and to come to Jesus is to be born again. And he gets marveled at that, you know, asking, you know, kind of in an earthly way, you know, how can I reenter into my mom's womb and be born again? And then, you know, Jesus said that unless you are born of water and of the spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. And what that's born flesh is flesh and what's born of spirit is spirit, you know, to marvel not, you know, what you said to you. I mean, what I said to you. And, you know, then now that kind of brings us to the verse that we're talking about now. Like if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how should you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Because like he's just thinking about it kind of in that earthly form and it's just completely just he's his his mind is blown like he's not used to the concept of being born again and just coming to faith to you know to be saved so i mean i think it's just a big point here it's like if he can't understand like this point like how is he going to under, like understand like how to go further or anything like that oh i think neil's back yeah uh i want to apologize to uh, Stephen and to Neil both because brother Neil made a text comment in here in the in the uh, chat area about you not being presented and you not being you being muted and I realize now that I I started like uh, last few days I started doing a setting for these broadcasts where when someone first comes in into the broadcast they're not automatically shown. I have to approve them. And I, I thought that, that you were already presented, and so therefore you'd, be, you're, you'd have audio and video. People would be able to hear you and see you. And yet I never did do that. And it just dawned on me because of Neil's note here. So uh, you are presented visually, and we can hear you. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think what you said tonight got heard. I'm really, really sorry about that. Brother Neil, how are you? No problem. God bless you, brother. Um, I was just saying, uh, uh, I've, I've been enjoying your videos lately and um, been watching them, even though I haven't been able to participate recently because of certain uh, situations in hacking that I have to go through with my class. But, uh, yeah, I've been talking a lot with a lot of brothers in Christ recently. Um, Unfortunately, I've been attacked um, by a couple of so-called Christians. I don't know if that's what they are, but, you know, and it's really sad to see other brothers come at me with these accusations, like um, that I'm a babe in Christ because I don't understand certain things the way that they do. So, to me, that's not really the way that you would address another Christian as a babe in Christ. That's kind of a derogatorily, derogatory way to address other people. Would you agree with that? Uh, well, the word that comes to mind is condescending, uh, that they feel that they're superior and you're inferior to them. It's not, no, it, it shouldn't be done that way. But um, first, let me uh, just ask you guys to say hi to each other. I don't know if you've met Brother Neil and Brother Stephen. Uh, I just met Brother Stephen tonight. and So uh, why don't you guys say hi to each other? What's up, bro? I will add you. Let me go ahead and do that. Yeah, sure. I think I've heard you before. Actually, you know, this is my first night actually being on one of these, so this is actually my first time. Well, uh, again, you have a YouTube channel? Uh, yes, I do. Like, I formed it back in 13, but I didn't join this community till like, probably two or three months ago. That's probably where I've, I've seen you before. But, um, or maybe in some comments or something like that. Um, but, uh, I just came in to pop in to say hi to Luke real quick, actually, and, uh, 
because I had commented on a couple of his videos. Uh, I appreciate all the biblical first names that we've been having. Luke, Samuel, uh, Matthew. Well, there are a lot of people that have been around that have uh, strong biblical first names like myself. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not just a coincidence, but it's, it's very funny to see all these people that are getting together uh, that just so happen to have biblical first names. <laughs> but yeah, I've got I, always, I always appreciate that fact too when I meet someone and they, they have a, a Bible name. I, but um, to, to get back to your point, uh, Brother Neo, the, uh, I have a playlist titled Dogmatists. Um, and the reason I ended up having to have this playlist is because uh, my experience on YouTube and now is, big, is about uh, almost eight years. The first year was just arguing with atheists. And then after that ran its course, I found out that there's a lot of lordship salvation as people who don't believe in faith alone. And I've been uh, arguing with them and defending faith alone. But what I found is that even when I meet someone who believes the core doctrines the way that we do, um, they, they end up wanting to argue over minor doctrines like Bible translations, like the rapture, uh, like so many other things. And, and, uh, and they wanted to fight and divide over minor doctrines. And that's, that's what I think you're going through here is that people are, one of the videos I was titled is called Nitpickers, uh, Net, Net uh, Strainers, yep. you know. And, and uh, th rather than saying, okay, brother, we, we agree on these basic essentials of Christianity and all the other stuff, let's, let's share our ideas. Let's, let's debate it out with respect and courtesy, and I want to learn your viewpoint. I'll listen carefully, and you listen to my viewpoint. And, you know, I've done that over the years, and there's been a few times where people persuaded me I was wrong, and there's been times I persuaded them, and they joined my side. But... Uh, the only thing you have to fear from these types of discussions is, is, is uh, the, the, your error is exposed. And, and, you know, if I have an error, I want it to be exposed. I want my errors to be, if I'm wrong, tell, tell me, and I want to correct it. But uh, that's what you're encountering, I think, is dogmatism and intolerance in the Christian community. I think it's like a legalism thing, like as if um, Jesus did not fulfill the entire law, then there's something that you need to do to be saved fully. Um, that's my biggest problem is the legal legalism um, that some people try to apply to the salvation that I've had, um, as if that I wasn't saved fully because I don't understand the legalism behind it and that... Um, you know, that kind of thing, but other than that, I'll let you continue your Bible worship because I don't want my problems to uh, invade your hang hangout, but I, I also have some other um, matters to attend. Uh, I'm making some dinner for, for my wife, and I'll be back a little bit yeah. later tomorrow. I was just, just going to tell you, it smells really good. Yeah, I'm making Monterey chicken. It's uh, chicken with bacon and uh, barbecue. Barbecue sauce and cheese. Excellent, brother. Wow. Okay. Really good. I, look forward, I look forward to next time we can talk. I'm glad you got to meet Stephen. And uh, I'm going to give, take a couple of minutes and, and give people an invitation to salvation now, brother. Okay, brother Stephen. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter uh, what book of the Bible we're studying. It doesn't matter what theological topic we study. Um, a person can be really learned in all these things, and yet if they don't get the one basic essential thing correct, uh, then uh, it, it's all vanity, as, as we find in Ecclesiastes. Uh, and that is, how does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? If you gain all this Bible knowledge, and yet you lose your soul, you don't get to go to heaven. Uh, so I want to be sure that if you're watching this broadcast now, that you don't miss what's most important. And that is, uh, if I asked you now, um, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? What would be your answer? I'll tell you the answer that, that most people tell me. 
uh, and this has been the universal answer that we most people in the world say today, and the most peop people throughout all of history have answered that question in this way. Do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Well, I, I think I might go to heaven. I'm hoping it. And, and I, it's because I'm a good person. Because, uh, you know, I, I did join a religion and I practiced my religion. And I, I as a matter of fact, I, I got baptized. And I, I go to confession and communion and, and I give to charity and I, I try to follow the golden rule. And you know, did you notice that Everything that I said was, I did this and I did that. In other words, they're basing their hope of salvation on the things that they've done. They're putting their faith in themselves and hoping, they say, and I hope it's good enough. I hope God thinks I'm good enough and he'll accept me into heaven. Uh, in Romans 10, 3, it makes this point that, that uh, people are trying to establish their own righteousness and hoping that it will satisfy God, but that's not God's way. That's, that's man's way. That's man's way of thinking. It's really a philosophy. It's called the merit system. People think that if, if I can get good enough, if I can abstain from sin, and if I can start doing a lot of good things, that I'll be acceptable, and uh, because of my personal merit, God will approve of me and let me into heaven. But that's not God's way. God's way is reject personal merit as the solution and put your faith in Jesus as the solution. Uh, put your, don't rely on your righteousness, but rely on his righteousness and his work, not your righteousness and your work. So that's the difference between the philosophies of all the religions of the world and what I will call biblical Christianity. Christianity, as we find it in the Bible, says that we don't go to heaven because of what we do. We go to heaven because of our faith in what Jesus did for us. And what did he do? He paid for all our sins when he died on the cross. So if you, if you can accept that fact and believe that he actually paid for all your sins and you know the significance of it, you should be jumping for joy right now. You should be saying, hallelujah, my sins are all paid for. Sin is not a factor for me anymore in the judgment. Amen. And so uh, if, if your sins are paid for and you believe it, now you know that you have access to God. But Jesus said, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. So he paid for your sins. Now all that's required of you is to come to him and put your faith in him. Believe the, there's a scripture that says, what do I have to do? What must I do to be saved? And the answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So, so we're just asking you now, do not believe in your own ability. Reject that. Instead, put your faith in Jesus. Depend on Jesus to get you into heaven. Rely on Jesus. Put all your confidence in Jesus and not in yourself. Now, I told you that he died on the cross. By the way, he is he said he is God, and he came down from heaven, and he became a man so that he could die on the cross. When he died on the cross, he paid for our sins, and he was truly dead. He was buried in a tomb for three days. But on the third day, he raised himself from the dead, and he predicted it. He prophesied it. He promised it. He told them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they didn't understand what he meant, but he, he was ref, ref, referencing his death, burial, and resurrection. He said that he would give us a sign to prove who he is so that we could feel confident in putting our faith in him. And when he raised himself from the dead and he, he walked for 40 days on the earth, over 500 witnesses saw him, touched him, ate with him. Uh, so because of that, resurrection that bodily resurrection we should have confidence that our faith in him is justified because he proved he's god and he has power over life and death he died but he brought himself back to life and he promises you and me all of us if you will put your faith in him then he will raise us from the dead after we die he will raise us up into life everlasting in heaven because of our faith in him not because of any righteous things we've done in our life, but because of our faith in him. Amen.
So I will ask Brother Stephen if he wants to, uh, to uh, say in his own words anything uh, regarding the gospel. Um, yeah, I mean, it's literally what you said. Like, there's nothing we can do on our own, like, self-righteous, even though that's the way that we're wired. You know, Jesus, you know, fully man, fully God, he came down here, took the form of a man. You know, he lived the perfect life. You know, he fulfilled the law. He was pleasing to God. You know, he did everything that we couldn't do. And, you know, it's just the ultimate gift. You know, I remember the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And, you know, a gift is something that, you know, is given to you freely, which is what he did when he died on the cross was buried and rose again. You know, he paid the debt and he's giving us a gift just for, you know, believing on him you know, and coming to him. You know, as he said, as it was said in, I believe, John six forty seven, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. All we have to do is believe because, you know, he did it all and, you know, he paved the way. You know, he rose again. You know, he proved who he was. You know, everything that he said has come true. You know, it, you know even going to the you know, temple of Jerusalem being knocked down and not one stone being laid on top of another. I mean, and he also said that his word, you know, endureth even to today, even though the heavens and earth may pass away, my words never pass away. You know, and he made us a promise through his gift. And that's the only way is to accept the gift, you know, and not rely on yourself or ever any of your own merit. And it's a free gift to, you know, everyone. Yeah, you use the word promise, and that's something I think I want everybody to understand, that the Bible says God cannot lie, God cannot break a promise. The Bible says Jesus is eternal, God Almighty, manifest in the flesh. Jesus promised that he will give you life everlasting in heaven if you put your faith completely in him. So because it's a promise from God, you can count on it. So... You, when you put your faith in Jesus, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Isn't that good news? That's why it's called the gospel. The gospel is a Greek word that means good news. Uh, all right, I'm going to lie in the live broadcast, and but brother Stephen, I'll talk to you privately after we close the live broadcast for a little bit. And uh, so, please, uh, if you did put your faith in Jesus tonight, uh, make a comment on this video, and please join me nightly. Uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.